the 369th edition of the Four Corners Podcast starts right now. This is the Four Corners Podcast. And that could make a difference. Lawson at the buzzer. Maybe not. Ty Lawson wins it at the buzzer. Deep three. And Green rips down the rebound in traffic. Four on one. What a great job. What a terrific job in transition. I mean, you could plan that any better as a coach. Gets the roll. Here we go. Page has it. Carolina down one. 84-83. Page into the front court with four seconds. Page to the rim. Got it. it. Got it. it. Nine-tenths of a second to go. Inbounds. Washington gets it to Warren. His full court shot. No good. Marcus oh, Page baby. dump it for the Tar Heels. Carolina wins it. Don't force it if you're Goss. Comes in. Blocked what? by Meeks. Buried right up ahead to Jackson. And he dunks it down for the five point lead. Matthews off the mark. And this year, the confetti. It's going to fall for North Carolina. They're not going to be denied this time. Inside 30 overall. Love. Ooh. Top of the key. Oh! Big time delivery. Here are your hosts, Josh Marlowe and Anthony Pagnotta. What's going on, guys? No, not quite Josh Marlowe and Anthony Pagnotta. It's just Anthony Pagnotta here with you. A day after Carolina's first round tournament victory over the Wagner Seahawks. I'll be here breaking it down for you guys. Unfortunately, late night last night and then some other uh, responsibilities for work earlier today. And so Josh, unable to be with us for the recap, but he will be back with us tomorrow to preview Carolina's game against Michigan State. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves. We have to talk about the win Over Wagner, play you the quote of the game from Hubert Davis, uh, and also give you a few takeaways from what we saw out there in Carolina's first tournament game since their run back in 2022. Uh, But yeah, you go and uh, we'll we'll dive right into it. Uh, Of course, this edition of the podcast is uh, powered by Carolina Electrical Services, as it always is. And uh, look, Carolina... You know, they this this was a game that I think we were kind of wondering what Carolina would look like. And I think one of the elements of this game that we didn't talk a whole lot about, but that we probably should have talked a lot about, was the youth on this roster, at least in terms of experience in the NCAA tournament. A lot of guys that had not been to the NCAA tournament in their career, if they had been, it was pretty early exits for them. Uh, the only guys that were on this roster that made a deep run, were clearly Armando and RJ. And look, both of those guys really showed. Um, But some of the other guys, you could see some of the nervousness there. Um, Look, RJ, Armando, both guys score over 20, 22 for Armando, uh, or 22 for RJ, 20 for Armando. Uh, And, you know, the big thing is, is that Carolina, they never trailed in this game. So they got out to the early 6-0 lead. Wagner fought. There were moments, uh, you know, where it looked like Wagner was, you know, at least hanging around, had a chance to potentially make it interesting. But the good news is, is that every time that that seemed to happen, Carolina seemed to have an answer. And that's the most important thing when it comes to a game like this. Ultimately, the biggest thing is that you just find a way to win because it is the NCAA tournament. It's about putting together a six game win streak. But I mean, look, this is a game that, you know, I think a lot of people felt like Carolina would dominate, wouldn't have much of an issue with, and that from here, moving forward, this is where you really are going to learn how good this team is and how deep of a run they can make um, based on how they look. And it'll it'll start on Saturday when they take on uh, Michigan State. Uh, but look, Carolina overall, I mean, offensively, good day. Shot 55% from the field. Uh, 50% from three, um, and really, I mean, just dominated uh, inside. And that was the biggest thing for Carolina. From the word go, 
there was a message, and this this was what R.J. Davis said in the post game was that there was a message to them that you need to come out here, put the ball inside because Wagner does not have the size uh, to compete with you. And Carolina immediately, to their credit. These guys knew, get it inside to Armando and eventually Jalen Withers and figure it out from there. And, um, you know, I, I think for Carolina, the biggest thing that that you were just wanting to see was them sort of settle into a rhythm. I thought the second half, you started to see that a little bit. Um, but look, offensively, there's not really much that you can gripe about offensively. I thought on that end of the floor, Carolina was sensational because, yes, they used the inside game to their advantage. And it really opened everything up from the outside. And as we know, once if things get opened up from the outside, that's where you're going to have someone like R.J. Davis, who's just in such a great rhythm. That's where you're going to have him thrive. And I thought you saw that yesterday. The thing that was amazing to me was the way that Jalen Withers played. And we'll, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about it when we get to the takeaways. But this is a guy that, you know, for the longest time, we were still trying to figure out you know, what exactly is his role on this team? And I think as the season's gone along, you've started to find that out. And yesterday was a perfect example of that. All right, guys, well, let's, let's take a look at the box score. Um, and it's it's one that you would expect to see for Carolina, um, you know, being that they did win the game. Carolina shoots 55% to Wagner's 40%. Uh, Three-pointers, Carolina 9 of 18 from beyond the York. Wagner 7 of 18 from behind the three-point line. Pretty successful second half for them, uh, especially you know when Carolina would make a run to lengthen the lead back out to 18 or 20. There were a couple of times where Wagner would respond with a couple of threes uh, and cut that lead back down and at least give themselves a chance to hang around in the game. Uh, Carolina 15 of 19 at the foul line. So they got to the foul line. They did, did a good job of making their free throws. And then, uh, you know, for Wagner, just nine of 15 turnovers. Carolina with nine. Wagner with eight points off turnovers. Wagner, believe it or not, the advantage there, 11 to nine in points off of turnovers. But this is really where you saw Carolina's dominance. Total, re, uh, total rebounds in the game, 43-24 advantage for Carolina. They had a 13-8 to advantage on the offensive glass. Led to 17 second-chance points for Carolina, which is solid, little over one per possession. And then bench points, Carolina outscores Wagner's bench 26-6. to Wagner, a team that came into the day playing with just seven guys. You knew Carolina could take advantage of that. But we talked about the dominance inside. The rebounding total shows you that. So does the points in the paint. 48 to 20 Carolina points in the paint. Fast break. RJ was talking about this as well with the media. He said early he didn't really think that they were able to get uh, get out and push the pace the way that they wanted to. They did more of it in the second half. They uh, outscore Wagner 14 to four in that category. Three blocks for Carolina, two for Wagner. Five steals for the Seahawks, just four for Carolina. And assists, Carolina 14 to uh, Wagner's eight. Uh, the game was tied just two times. That was uh, early in the game, and it was tied for just a minute 22. The rest of the game was in Carolina's favor. They led 38 uh, minutes and 27 seconds in this game. Um, this, you know, it, it's a box score that makes sense, especially for a matchup like this. Um, and really shows, I think, where the, the areas where Carolina did dominate, but it also shows the area, three point shooting, where Carolina probably wants to improve a little bit and be a little bit better. Um, that's the thing that you, you take away really coming out of this game is that, yes, very good performance on the offensive end of the floor. Um, especially on the inside, but still a lot of things uh, that you can grow on, uh, that Carolina can uh, grow on um, heading into tomorrow's matchup with Michigan State. All right, let's take a look, uh, take a listen to Hubert Davis after the game, and he was talking about how uh, big Armando's game was and how important Armando is to the success of uh of this team it's been on my mind all season you know especially a lot more towards the end that you know what armando has meant to me personally but what he's meant to this program and this university and this community and i just 
I just told them in the locker room. I said, wherever all my comments come from is there is a desperation because I want Armando and everyone, I want them to be able to see and experience the things that us as coaches have seen and experienced. It's just really proud of Armando. Somebody just made a stat. What was it? 15 rebounds, six straight NCAA tournament games. I mean, that's just, that's unreal. And um, can't think of a better person to be able to do that than Armando. Yeah, and look, that's, I mean, this is the name of the game for Armando at this point in the NCAA tournament. Um, he, you know, this is the seventh straight double-double in a tournament game, um, which means, you know, all six games, of course, back in 2022 and now this game. And it's the sixth straight game that he's had more than 15 rebounds. And that's that, that's unbelievable. Um, it shows you that he's a guy that really turns it on come tournament time. And you know, the best part, listening to him after the game, you know, he wasn't thrilled with his performance. He thinks he can be better. Um, now, you know, rebounding wise, that wasn't I, I don't think that was necessarily what he was talking about. Uh, but he did not like the way that he played defensively. And he feels like he has to play better against Michigan State on that end of the floor. So this is a guy that despite putting up 20 and 15, Despite having that stat of sixteen uh, or of uh, of six straight games with fifteen or more points uh, or more rebounds, jeez, jeez, guys, it was a late one last night. I'm sorry. Um, it's uh, he's still a guy that I, it feels humble. He wants to improve in other areas. He's always looking to see what are the areas that I didn't look good yesterday in, and I, I think the fact that. You know, he's acknowledging that and that he's, you know, focusing on trying to be even better than he was in this game is why there's a chance that he can come out and put together the type of numbers that he had in this game against Wagner when the team takes the court on Saturday against Michigan State. But, I mean, look, ultimately, you know, Hubert said it. I mean, this guy, this this guy means a lot to Carolina. Though To have that type of presence on the inside is huge. And that's going to be one of the things we're going to talk about when you know we preview that game against Michigan State. They're a team that has not defended uh, down low very well throughout the season. Now, they did a great job yesterday against Tolu Smith. But bigs, especially guys that can play physically, have bothered them. And that's what we're seeing from Armando Baycott. It feels like he just knows. And we've, we've talked about it here on the podcast. Armando, I'm, I, I mean, I don't want to – make it seem like he's not trying, but he picks his moments where he really turns it up another level. He knows that there are certain times a year, especially when you get to the NCAA tournament, where it's time to be Armando Baycott. And I thought yesterday we saw that. Now, granted, it's a Wagner team that just does not have the size, cannot match them physically, but you saw a man that was on a mission from the word go. And here's the thing. He had some good games early in the season against mid-majors. That performance that he had yesterday, though, was better than any of the performances that he had against the mid-majors. This dude was locked in and ready to go. And if that is the Armando Baycott that we're going to get, I think Carolina has a chance to go really, really deep in this NCAA tournament. Uh, it's more about the guys that are around him and R.J. Davis who you know, performed pretty well. And you know, we'll talk about that here in a second as well. Well, so we've sort of set the scene for you. Um, just one other thing, the stat of the game, you know, points in the paint have to be the stat of the game in this one. Carolina just dominated there. It was a focus of this team from the word go, and they got it inside. And when you have, you know, Armando playing the way that he is, and then Jalen Withers having a career day of his own, at least a Tar Heel, uh, you know, the best day of his Tar Heel career. Um, you know, there was just nothing Wagner could do. No matter what they threw at both of those guys, those guys did a great job of finishing inside. Both guys went to the foul line a ton. Um, you know, I, I, I definitely uh, Baycott six of seven from the foul line. Uh, Jalen Withers six and nine. Definitely some hard fouls for Jalen Withers. Uh, he is not a he's a man that every time he gets fouled. Me and uh, Josh were talking about it. When we were watching the game, every time he gets fouled, it seems like it's a hard foul. There's really no in-between for Jalen Withers. Um, it's always a tough ball for him, but uh, he was still, I mean, great throughout the entire game. And, um, you know, I think that's that's something that we were hoping to see from him, and it's, it's great to see that he is performing at this level down the stretch of the season. All right, guys. Well, uh, you know, 
We'll be back uh, here shortly to take you through the takeaways from this game. But first, we have to tell you about Autograph. And guys, Autograph is a tremendous app. Head over to the Apple App Store, download it now, and get in with the uh, code HEELTOUGH. Uh, and all one word, and when you do, it'll give you a chance to get tickets to some of these games. They're giving out tickets to a ton of these regionals. So make sure that you are in the Autograph app, signed up. Uh, that's the only way you can get access to this. And when you get access to this stuff, I, I mean, these, these experiences are once in a lifetime. So make sure that you guys are checking this stuff out uh, on, over on the Autograph app. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just a tremendous chance for you guys to get to experience some of the great things that we were able to experience yesterday at a discounted price. All right, guys, let's get into the takeaways from the game. And again, we both have to start, you know, we have to start by talking about the performances of both Armando Baycott and RJ Davis. Both guys shined in their return to the NCAA tournament. Uh, tremendous showings for for both. Uh, I thought R.J. Davis, 22 points. Um, you know, there it, it wasn't the hottest start for him. He didn't take over the game early. Um, you know, had just five points in the first half, but only shot it four times in that first half because the game uh, the game was being played on the inside. But once again, uh, like I said, the way that Carolina played inside opened up that outside game, and that's where R.J. Really, really shined. I mean, finishes the day 8 of 13 from the field, hits four more threes, 22 points to lead the way for him. And then um, Armando just dominant. I, I mean, this is the thing. It's it's tournament Armando. They're, they're, this is something that we can use as a phrase right now because he was absolutely dominant from the word go. He looked locked in, um, you know, con confident, and was hitting all of the shots that at times throughout the year have not been going in. And that's the biggest thing is that when some of those lay-ins that he's been missing are able to go in, it really sets you up to have some success. Carolina needs that presence on the inside because, yeah, as good as R.J. Davis has been this year, having a guy like Armando Baycott that can get you 20 a night, can get you 15 rebounds is huge. And the thing is, is he's had to really turn his game back up um, on the glass because Harrison Ingram, I mean, look, five rebounds in this game is is not bad. Wagner was a smaller team. They were trying to take him away from the basket. But this has not been the greatest finish to the year for Harrison Ingram on the glass. He wasn't, you know, he's a guy that led uh, the ACC in rebounding and conference play. But, you know, the since the start of the ACC tournament, he hasn't been rebounding really at that level. Had a good rebounding day against Florida State. But this is now three straight games where he's had five rebounds or less. So it feels like Armando is the guy that's sort of picking up the slack there. But, I mean, look, he's getting help from Jalen Withers on the inside. Still, if, if Carolina is going to make a deep run, we've said it, you want Armando to be the guy that he was back in 2022. He doesn't have to be nearly as dominant game in, game out offensively because you trust that guys like Cormac Ryan – Harrison Ingram can pick up the slack around him. But, you know, if, if he can continue to play the way that he has played really the second half of the year offensively and, you know, do the things that we've seen him do defensively that earned him first team all ACC uh, defense, then I, I think Carolina's ceiling is as high as anybody in this NCAA tournament. And so, I mean, for both of those guys, you're thinking it, it's got to carry over. Both guys seem uh, prepared to take on that load. Um, and and really, you know, you see the leadership from these guys. That was one of the things I noticed about those two guys. And just hearing them talk in the, in the post game as well. Um, they are the guys in that locker room that are seen as the leaders. They're the guys that everybody is um, – you know, is looking towards because of their lack of experience in the tournament. They're looking towards two guys that were a part of that run back in 2022 and saying, how can we recreate this? What did you guys have to do during that run? Uh, both guys said a lot of questions being asked by some of the younger guys, and they're leading by example the way that you want them to. 
Let's talk about Jalen Withers, though, because this was an outstanding game. And during the postgame uh, presser, uh, you know, players had walked off. Hubert was still up there. And uh, I, I had to get one question in about Jalen Withers because I really wanted to know from Hubert. It seemed like down the stretch here, really – uh, since the calendar turned to the month of March, Jalen Withers has taken his game to another level. And we saw it at times in the middle of conference play, that when he's in there, when he's rebounding well, this is that that's when he can really become a weapon for Carolina because of his versatility, because of the way that he can defend on the perimeter. And so, um, you know, you saw yesterday what I think he has come to learn that his role is. He's a guy that, yeah, in the past at Louisville, they needed him to be a guy that could stretch the floor. He had to be able to knock down shots from the outside. And I think early in the year, he was trying to sort of shoot himself into that rhythm. Defensively, I, I thought he'd been solid for most of the year. But offensively, there were times where it just wasn't there for him. And then you just didn't see the rebounding production that you're seeing now. And look, when he was at Louisville, he wasn't the greatest rebounder known to man. But this was the type of performance that is starting to become more and more common with him. Scoring wise, this was a whole nother level. And who knows if you if he can give you that off the bench along with what you get at times from Seth Trimble, man, Carolina's bench is one of the stronger ones left in this NCAA tournament. But um, I think the most important thing is you need him to be able to rebound because if he can be that guy coming off the bench that rebounds at a high level, it can allow Carolina to do so many different things. It allows them um, you know, to be able to use him in a line, especially right now, use him in a lineup even with Harrison Ingram and Armando Baycott on the floor because they used it a lot yesterday. And I think you're going to probably see a lot of it again tomorrow. I know that Michigan State is a guard-oriented team, um, and that's one of the – things that Carolina is going to have to find a way to take away is, is their ability to stretch the floor and knock down shots. But Jalen Withers is, is a capable defender out on the perimeter, as I was saying. And, you know, the thing is, is that Elliot Cadeau is really struggling right now. And I think that these lineups that have Jalen Withers, you know, out there uh, at the four and allow Harrison Ingram to move to the three at this point, you know, you wonder, is that your best lineup that Carolina can roll out there? Because even, even Seth Trimble, I mean, he wasn't bad yesterday. Um, you know, just really didn't do a whole lot. Um, kind of was quiet uh, on the score sheet. Five points. Wasn't bad. Five points on two or three shooting. Had two rebounds um, as well. But, uh, you know, Jalen Withers playing 21 minutes and giving you that type of production while he's out there is huge for this team. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is Hubert said something that I think we just haven't really talked a whole lot about with him. And don't get it wrong. I, I've been pretty critical of Jalen Withers for the majority of the season. Um, I thought with him being a veteran, you saw you know guys like Cormac and Cormac even took a little bit of time. But um, you, you saw guys like Cormac and Harrison Ingram through different points of the year um, start to really settle into their roles. But they did it relatively quickly. With Jalen Withers, I thought he would do the same thing because he had played in the ACC. He was familiar with these types of opponents. But uh, Hubert said, look, you know, making that move, moving from um, one team to another, especially at the age that these guys are in college. If Hubert said, look, I had to do it in the NBA, but I was older. These are guys that are making this move while in college. So there's a lot of different things that are going on in their heads. Um, you know, there's a lot of different responsibilities that they have to take on. So that's the thing. Not only do you have to settle into playing with your basketball team, you have to settle into a new school. You have to settle into a new social environment, all that kind of stuff. And I don't think we really gave Jalen Withers, you know, a, a, enough time. And, and again, it's me included to really settle in to his role. And now as the season has gotten into the home stretch to the games that matter, he has really done that. And I mean, I, I think there's a good chance that he will be someone that can create problems tomorrow against Michigan state as well, because the way he played inside yesterday, and he's been doing this these last few games, the physicality that he plays with inside Michigan state is a team that, yeah, they're, they're a really good defensive team, but teams have been able to attack them down low. 
I think he's a guy that could build off of that. And the other thing is, is it's really special for him to do it in this town. His dad was a uh, was a player for the Charlotte 49ers uh, back when he was in college. He grew up here, and for him to come back to this city and really take over this game. I mean, there was one point where he was the best player on the floor, even when Armando was out there with them. He was just, I mean, he was seeking the ball. He was being aggressive. He was getting to the foul line. And even when he got to the foul line, not the best free throw shooter, went six of nine, though, from the foul line, which is pretty solid for him. And so I think for Carolina, you know, to have those those guys inside, um, you know, and for him to really be able to come in and help supplement at times what are you know what Armando's doing. Carolina sometimes playing small, or uh, you know to be that complement to Jalen Washington on the inside when he's in there. I think is just huge, um, and hopefully that's something that can continue to carry over throughout the rest of the tournament for him. One of the other things that now you know, look, we talked about some of the positives from this game, but this was not Carolina's best performance of the season. Um, these guys, you know, in the post game. You know, even when they were up on the stand with Hubert, said, look, we have to be better than we were today. We did not play our best game. And then once they broke out um, into the stand-up interviews in the hallway, you know, I got to, you know, hear a little bit of what both of those guys were saying, uh, Armando and RJ, that is. And, you know, they, they said, look, we don't feel like we played our best game defensively. We feel like we were a little sluggish at times. And so – I, I think, you know, that's where you got to start with the takeaways. I, I do on on the negative side, I guess it's negative. But look, I mean, Carolina was definitely sluggish at times. They let Wagner hang around, which is something that Carolina has had a problem with doing pretty much all year. Um, but I do think that you saw as the game wore along, Carolina did not let Wagner stick around and, you know, at least make things a, a little bit more tense at the under four timeout. Carolina eventually took this game over and ran away with it. They got the walk-ons into the game. So, I mean, look, it was it the what was it a perfect performance? No. Defensively, I do think that at times it was way too easy for guys to get to the rim. Um, you know, there there were a couple of times they only scored 20 points in the paint, but there were bursts where Wagner would get a couple buckets inside. And then in the second half, it was really all about Wagner's three-point shooting. And and don't get it wrong. I mean, they've got some talented players um, that, you know, I, I think were just on a heater. I mean, guys that were not shooting that well coming into the game or, you know, into the, the tournament that sort of built off of their performance from the other night. I mean, Julian Brown was fantastic. And he came in averaging just 10 points was not uh, the most efficient shooter from the outside, but he had a tremendous uh, tremendous game, just like he did it in the uh, first four game the other night for Wagner against Howard. He was 6 of 10, 4 of 8 from the outside. So, yeah, the majority of the three-point shots dropping were from him. Um, and, look, Melvin Counson Jr., you know, he had his moments, but he was 6 of 20. So Carolina held him in check. They did what they had to do with him. But you just had a guy in Brown that got hot from the outside. Keontae Lewis, there wasn't a ton of resistance on the inside against him. He had 13 points on six of eight shooting. So those are the areas that Carolina has to get better. And Armando said that. He graded himself out as an F. He did not think that he defended well. I wouldn't have said an F. I thought there were some moments, especially in that second half, where you saw some really, really good defensive plays from Armando that show you why he was an all-defense member in the ACC. But, I mean, I think this is one of those games where, you know, they they mentioned it. They came out sluggish. And, I mean, I, I don't know. To me, I didn't watch them and think their energy wasn't there. I thought it was. But I do think that you saw some of the nerves of being in the NCAA tournament, of – being, you know, a team that, you know, is a one seed going up against a 16 after what happened last year with FDU going up against Purdue. I think that you, that you that's going to be a theme that you're going to see. I mean, Purdue plays later today. I think there'll be some uh, some moments maybe where people are looking at that game. Um, you know, that, of course, Purdue experienced it last year. So, yeah, there will be a time probably early in that game where if things do start to go wrong. People will be sitting on their couch wondering, oh, here we go. Houston, it could potentially be the same thing. Even even UConn, 
Um, because now this is the ex, this is something that people are looking for just about each, uh, uh, just, just about every year because the upsets, you know, 215 upset is becoming almost a yearly occurrence now. And it's now two times in the last five years that 16s have upset ones. So, I mean, I think that was the, that was the thing. The energy was there for Wagner. Maybe Carolina didn't expect that a little bit, but they need to know going into Saturday's game that the energy is going to be there for Michigan State and that they have to be able to match it and come out a little bit faster than they did. Hopefully this experience being the first tournament game for most of these guys has settled these guys down and they'll be in a rhythm from the word go. Well, one of the guys that specifically struggled is Elliot Cadell and, I mean, this has just become the trend here down the stretch is that Elliot Cadeau is starting to lose minutes uh, because he simply cannot help Carolina on the offensive end. He's turning the ball over too much. And that was part of the issue for him yesterday. Um, he, nine total turnovers in the game for Carolina. And four of them came from Elliot Cadeau. He was 0 of 2 from the field. And don't get it wrong. He had his moments where he flashed. He had three assists and a couple of nice passes as that – um, set guys up, but I mean, this is, this is just happening too often for Elliot Cadeau now where he's disappeared. He wasn't attacking the rim the way that I wanted him to. Um, when we talked about, when we were previewing the game, um, and, and I mean, to me, that's, that's the, that's when he is playing his best. I, I get it that people are going to be looking for how he's moving the basketball, but when Elliot Cadeau is playing his best this year, it's when he's getting downhill drawing defenders and kicking or finishing at the rim. And I just think you didn't see enough of that. He had an opportunity early in the game to finish a lay-in and missed it. That's been something that we've seen here um, within the last four or five games that he just cannot find a way to hit those shots at the rim uh, that were gimmies early in the season. Um, he's a guy that had really mastered that high lay-in off the glass um, but even that is not going anymore. So the confidence level is definitely down. He was down on himself in the locker room too. Uh, I did not get a chance to go into the locker room. I just stayed out uh, in the hallway with Armando and RJ uh, out there. But, uh, you know, there were a lot of people that went in, a lot of reporters that went in and got some of the quotes from Elliot with him basically saying, look, I have to be, I have to be better. I was terrible today. Um, and that's, you know, hopefully – he, he said that he will bounce back, and I'm hoping that's the mindset that he's taking. But you really do wonder, with a guy that young in the NCAA tournament, now you're going up against a team in Michigan State that people are suddenly all over the bandwagon for. Well, you know, Is he going to have a, have a chance to actually really bounce back? Um, but you know, I give credit to Hubert Davis. When Elliot Cadeau has struggled, even with as talented as he is, yes, you want to let him work through some of those things. But this is the most important time of the year. This is winning time. And so when he saw those struggles, that's where you saw some of the lineups where Jalen Withers was in the game, um, you know, and, and along with Baycott and Harrison Ingram. And that's also where Carolina has been using Seth Trimble. And you'll probably see a lot of Trimble on Saturday, especially against a team that is so guard-oriented like Michigan. They want him out there defending on the perimeter and uh, doing the things that have made him so successful uh, off the bench for Carolina as their top defender. So um, for Cadeau, I mean, I, I hope he's able to bounce back. We've seen him do it uh, at, at other times this year, especially some of those games early in the year where he got in foul trouble. He would respond with a nice offensive game. Uh, I think that's certainly on the table, but uh, it's far from a guarantee at this point that Cadeau, uh, who you know is is looking like a freshman, is going to be able uh, to respond the way that Carolina was probably hoping that he would. That that means if not, you need some of the other guys to pick up some slack there. That's where you really need Seth Trimble to be a guy that you know almost plays starter like minutes. If once Carolina gets deeper and deeper into this tournament. Um, so yeah, I, 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 that's, uh, you know, that, that's the biggest thing for Carolina. Um, let's get to our discussion topic. And look, you know, the thing is, is Carolina, I mean, they, they played pretty well yesterday, win by 28. They had their moments where they were frustrated with themselves. 
Well, the ultimate question is, did Carolina do anything yesterday to make us more uh, believe in them a little bit more for this tournament run? And ultimately, do I think that there are people that probably believe in them more based on yesterday? No. Do I think there's elements of this team that you saw yesterday that maybe you weren't counting on going into the NCAA tournament? Yes. Um, I think that the reason why you can't say that it's it made you believe in them more is because I think a lot of people are looking at Michigan State and wondering, was yesterday enough for you to believe in them? I still think Carolina has you know some difficult games that are ahead. And look, yesterday you played a mid-major in the round of 64. You should not be pounding your chest over that. But I will say that the way that Armando played, basically picking back up where he left off in the 2022 tournament, and the fact that you're getting some production off the bench from Jalen Withers, rebounding-wise, yes, but also scoring-wise, that's reasons to maybe believe a little bit more in Carolina. But at the same time, I just I can't put that much stock in a game in a, in a one versus sixteen game. Um, I I still think that Carolina um, is one of the favorites to win the national championship, and that's that's the other part of it too. Is that I believe in Carolina uh, about as much as any team in the country outside of of UConn. I mean, UConn I think at this point is probably a step ahead of Carolina just because of how much depth they have. Um, the scoring across the board, we know it's there. Uh, and that's that's the reason that I, I picked them in my bracket over Carolina. But I believe that Carolina is probably the second best team in the country right now. And so that's the thing. I, I don't think you can really use yesterday as a reason to believe more. Um, but, you know, th this the, this is still something that um, I think Carolina fans, you know, they're, they're trying to feel it out. Some people liked the performance yesterday. Others felt like it could have been a little bit more dominant. Um, but, you know, I, I still think that yesterday was enough from this group to at least have you feeling pretty confident going into Saturday. I know Tom Izzo and his group looked good yesterday. Defensively, they created a ton of turnovers and their guards shot the lights out. But their guards hadn't shot that well the entire season. That was really the first time all year that all of their guards shot well on the same day. And turnovers were still an issue in the game for Michigan State. We'll break it down a little bit further, but there is no reason that Carolina coming out of this game, even though they had moments where they looked sluggish, where they weren't playing the way that um, you know, they, they're up to their standard that they put on themselves on the defensive end of the floor. There's still a reasons to believe that this Carolina team is destined to make a long run in March. All right, guys. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this edition of the podcast. Make sure you head over to the website, heeltoughblog.com. Check out all the coverage that we've had up there for you. Josh is going to take you through every game of the NCAA tournament with previews and recaps. Uh, also, um, you know, a, a breakdown of the West region. If you're wondering about some of the other teams that Carolina could possibly have to face along the way, I wrote that article, posted it uh, early yesterday morning. Still relevant because Carolina still with a chance to play a lot of the teams in this region. So make sure that you go back and take a look at that as well. And then he will have you covered tonight uh, or tomorrow. Uh, excuse me. Jeez, it is. Yes. Last night was an incredibly late night staying up watching the end of that Kansas game and then having to wake up this morning at around uh, 530. So, um, but yeah, make sure you, you keep an eye out tomorrow evening. He'll have the recap, uh, the recap article up for you. And then we will be doing the recap edition of the podcast tomorrow night. Before that, we'll have the preview podcast for the game against Michigan State. Josh will be back with me. That'll be tomorrow morning. We'll break down everything uh, Mich everything Carolina, Michigan State, and get you prepared for that one. Also, uh, check out the website uh, as well for all the latest on the football side of things with spring practice beginning this week. A couple articles up there for you guys, including a uh, look at the battles to watch or at least monitor during spring camp. All right, guys, so that wraps it up for this edition of the podcast. I want to thank you guys for watching and listening, and as always, 
Go Tar Heels!